All right, let's get into it, everyone. It's after further review on a Monday morning here at WKYC.com. Also on our app on Facebook Live and YouTube, I'm Dave DiNatale. Happy to have you with us and happy to be joined right out of the shoot by the voice of the Browns, Jim Donovan. And uh, Jimmy, good morning. And uh, I, I, we're in a situation now where I guess – Good losses are no longer good for the Cleveland Browns for a team that's expecting to be a playoff team. And as hard as they played last night, it was still a game that they had in their grasp to maybe win and they couldn't pull it out. I would agree with you about that, uh, Dino. It's, um, and I think it really uh, comes down to uh, a problem that has been bubbling really since the uh, start of the season. And that is the offense is not performing at a level that we expected them to, at the level that their talent matches up against. And it's just not there. And uh, it starts up front. It's not there on the offensive line. It's not there in the ideology of what they're trying to do. Um, and it's, it's definitely not there uh, in, the, uh, in the chain of command that whatever is going on, uh, um, how plays come down from upstairs, down to the sideline, out to the huddle, and then at the line of scrimmage. Um, it's chaotic at times, and I think it really, if you go into the game and you get the injury report that the Browns handed in at the start of the game last night and how just cataclysmic that was defensively with the entire secondary being out, and yet the defense comes up with three turnovers in the game and gives up 20 points, uh, you would expect that the offense with the type of people and personnel that they have would be able to carry that score and better it and win the football game. And that goes for the Tennessee game, too. And and really, a big chunk of the of the Jets game against their vastly undermanned Jets team. But this offense, is uh, it, it is the whole problem right now for the Browns. It was expected to be explosive, and it really has fizzled so far through the first three games. And it has to get fixed. It really does for this team to to really become anything close to what they want to become. Okay, with all that, it's almost like I need you to be Dr. Donovan this morning. Um, where do you go first? I mean, I, I even put it on Twitter. Is it the offensive line that needs to be shored up? And some of that is getting Chris Hubbard back and healthy. Is it Baker needs to take a deep breath and just relax? Or is it that maybe Freddie needs to delegate a little bit of the play calling while he also focuses on being the head coach of this football team? Well, I think that we would have to know what the actual offense is uh, to really decipher that part of it. But that would be the master plan is um, how much of it is Todd Munkin's offense and how much of it is Freddie Kitchen's offense. And, you know, we were, I think, led to believe that it was the Kitchens offense. Mm -hmm. But after all, Todd Bunkin came here and, and you know, joined the staff. And there was a reason he came here. And I don't think he came here to just sit up in the press box and put a headset on. I think he wanted to have an influence. He wanted to bring some of that air raid type offense into the Browns offensive, um, you know, schematics. And uh, so there has to be some part of the Todd Munkin influence on the offense how much is it and then what are the mechanics of how do they put the game plan is game plan in is the head coach doing that because he's the offensive coordinator does munkin do it do they do it together and then the third thing is as the game goes on what is the mechanism of calling the plays because there were a number a number of times yesterday where the Browns were chaotic at best on the sidelines and getting a play in of what they wanted to do, who the personnel was going to be. They, uh, they couldn't get lined up. I mean, and it leads to um, kind of just this chaotic situation at the line of scrimmage, the inability to get lined up a number of times, a lot of formation penalties, you know, two guys, yes. illegal shifts and things like that, uh, you know, false starts. And then I think it, the, the other problem, the big problem is it was a total eva uh, over-evaluation of the offensive line. Uh, Greg Robinson is not playing the way he played in the final eight or nine games of the season last year when he took over at the left tackle spot. And then I think that as the, uh, as the off season, you know, became the uh, start of training camp, I don't think, Dino, we ever said, the Browns' right side of the offensive line is going to be Eric Cush at right guard, and the right tackle would be Justin McCray. No. And I realize McCray is only in there because Hubbard is hurt. 
But I think the inability all all off season from the time they traded Zeitler to the Giants, the inability to come up with a firm answer on the right side of the offensive line at right guard has really made the Browns a left-handed team. They have to go left. They have to go left all the time to try and do anything that's going to be productive. And so they are really one-dimensional. And it's a big problem. I mean, the offense is a big, big mess right now. Yeah, I wonder. So, I, and I was thinking about that last night. It's almost like, and it's, and, and we still, we've only played three games, so I don't want to uh, pronounce Olivier Vernon a bust or anything like that. But I wonder if, if, if John Dorsey had a do-over, if, if he would make that trade again, knowing, you know, about this offensive line and and how good Zeitler was at that right guard, a Pro Bowl caliber player. Yeah, well, it was a double situation, Dino, because it really goes back to, um, well, really, it's almost three-pronged. Number one, uh, they were trying to make Miles Garrett um, really the elite defensive pass rusher that they all believe he's going to be. Um, And they didn't feel that he had enough support on the other side. So Agba became trade bait, and he went to Kansas City. Agba had a great game yesterday against the Ravens. Yes. Now you come in and and Vernon comes in here, and at the time then you say, well, I mean, Olivier Vernon's history has been that if he's healthy, he's very, very productive and a good pass rusher, and if for nothing else, he'll occupy some space and attention, and that should allow Garrett to to really become the guy that we all hope and expect that he's going to be. And there are some signs that that's going to happen. Um, But then, you know, Zeitler... It was the was the asking price, and they traded him away. I think that uh, that was a big that was a big concession by the Browns mm-hmm. because you're kind of you know you're Robin Peter to pay Paul there. You're you know you're trying to help the defense, but you're probably hurting the offense. And right now, you're really hurting on that offensive line. The offensive line is a real problem because even though you can go inside the play calling and what they're actually trying to do in conception as far as what they're trying to do with the offense, the basic factor is this. Mayfield is harassed, really, on every play, uh, whether he's out of the shotgun or the very few times he's underneath center. He really doesn't have a clean pocket at all. That's why he's all over the place. That's why he's just trying to find a little bit of a throwing lane. That offensive line is, is ending up in his lap most times, and it doesn't matter whether it's the Rams, the Titans, the Jets, or probably on Sunday the Ravens. So. That, that's really the whole problem. There's kind of a leak down effect is how it's kind of dripped into this big puddle now for the Browns offensively. He is the voice of the Browns, Jim Donovan, joining us here on After Further Review. And and how many times in the offseason, you and I talked about it on our show, you know, one thing now in the NFL that's the rage with defenses is they're, they're sending the rushers in the quarterback's face instead of always just it's it's being able to go around left tackle or something a lot of it now is getting in the quarterback's face and getting in his vision and disrupting his vision and teams are doing that more with baker here yeah i think this three-step drop for baker mayfield um is almost obsolete right now um i don't know that he can execute that properly the way he did at the end of the year last year when he was really in rhythm and the ball was coming out of there quickly, it was because, I mean, he could just drop back. He had a progression. He had a read. It was open. Uh, He had that beat and a half or just a beat to throw the ball. Um, Very few times have I noticed he's been able to do that. That's why he's throwing off his back foot so many times. I think that's why he's high and, you know, wide on a number of throws. I just don't think mechanically he's able to set up. Now, there are times when he is, and then it's the old Mayfield. It's the Mayfield of the last you know, nine or eight, eight or nine games of the season last year. But I think that that's a real problem right now for the Browns. I think, uh, whereas everybody will say this in football, the game is controlled up front, whether it's defensively or offensively. And that offensive line is starting to really show that they are getting controlled by whoever the defense is on that particular Sunday. What was uh, a more head scratcher for you and Deke up, up in the booth, the the decision on fourth and nine to run the draw there in the fourth quarter or when they got the ball inside the the, the, the ten yard line or inside the five actually and they had all their timeouts left and I was actually you know when, when Landry had initially made the catch before the penalty was called I was sitting there go take a timeout take a timeout but they had all their timeouts remaining they didn't run the ball once in those four downs before, uh, at the goal line well, both situations are very, very bizarre. The fourth and nine is unbelievable. Uh, I don't even know how Mayfield 
with a straight face or a stern face could have gone into that huddle with the 10 guys around him and say, hey, listen, this is the play we're going to do. We're going to really outsmart them here. It's fourth and nine, and we're going to try and run the football, and we're going to try and run through Michael Brockers and uh, Aaron Donald and Eric Weddle and all of these guys. That's what we're going to try and do. And the other thing was, I mean, there were so many Rams up on the line of scrimmage. Yes. I mean, it was just the numbers game was just totally against what they were trying to do. So that is going to go down as a very, very bizarre call. Now, think about this. When they got down inside the five-yard line at the four, you're right. They had all of their timeouts left. So the clock became obsolete. They right. didn't have to worry about the clock at all because if they needed to stop it, they could stop it. Um, here's the thing. The four plays at the end of the game remind me so much of the four plays at the end of the game last year in Baltimore yes. in the last game of the regular season. Uh, all the Browns needed was about – uh, maybe nine, ten yards to get a field goal attempt and win the game and in Baltimore and knock the Ravens out of the playoffs and send the Steelers in as the AFC North champs and give the Browns their, uh, you know, give themselves uh, uh, their eighth win of the season. Uh, that's all they needed. They needed one play to get it in and get an, a field goal attempt. And the four plays fizzled, uh, whether it was execution or what they exactly were trying to do. And that's what reminded me last night as I kind of was driving home. I'm saying, boy, where did I see this before? Mm. Albeit it wasn't down inside the five-yard line last year in Baltimore, but it was in the same, same type of situation, that all you needed to do was get one play, and, and you're in. And in this case last night, you would have been able to tie the game up. So, I mean, I have to tell you, I don't know why Nick Chubb becomes a forgotten piece of the puzzle so many times with this offense as they continue to look to move the ball. But with three timeouts from the four-yard line, I would like to think that I would give Nick Chubb at least one one of those four plays that they ran down there. But those were four terribly executed and poorly called plays. And, and that's the thing. I, I applauded Freddie because I thought, you know, despite the fact that on a lot of occasions during the course of the game – you know, they didn't give up on the run, and they stayed with Chubb, even on fourth and nine. But then, like you said, if all of a sudden you have amnesia at the goal line with all your timeouts at the four. I mean, even if he gets even if he gets brought down for a one-yard loss, you take the timeout at second down or third down, and you, you, you try something else. Yeah, the other thing was, uh, Dino, he was out wide all the time. He wasn't even in the backfield for most, if not all of those plays. I mean, he was out wide. Every play also was a uh, was a play to the right side. I mean, he rolled right, and of course, once he starts drifting and rolling out, you know that the play is dead, and it certainly was on the fourth down play. Um, but I mean, you know, he never looked left, so Chubb became a no factor. He wasn't even a guy that you could fake off of. Um, you know, it wasn't even a situation. I don't understand why he wasn't in the shotgun with him, hmm. and uh, you know, you'd go play action, give him a look anyway, and make the Rams think. Well, maybe they're going to run here. I mean, you know, um, it, it was just uh, four really poorly called plays. I mean, really at a very, very critical time. And it really reminds me so much of that final series of the uh, regular season last year, which we all kind of walked away and went, well, that's OK. I mean, it was a good year. They're, look at what's coming up. They're bright. They're they're exciting. They're young. And, uh, you know, we'll take our, our consolation prize of getting the seven wins and a good finish to the year. But. You know, it, it seems a bit, you know, systemic now that the Browns in in the clutch seem to have a brain freeze as far as what they want to do offensively and what plays they've selected to run at critical times in the game. Uh, defensively, first and foremost, I, I just a tip of the cap to TJ Carey. You know, I think we forget, uh, you know, last year because of the, the Ward was, was hurt on, on a couple of occasions. Mitchell was hurt on an occasions. Yeah, you know, he's a valuable guy to have on your bench. He came through with the interception last night. And, uh, you know, the secondary as a whole, considering how shorthanded they were, I mean, they gave a yeoman's effort out there. Yeah, they really did. I, I um, you know, I never, you know, conceptualized that the Browns were in such an injury state that they were as the practice week went along. I, I mean, I... I really thought Randall would play. Mm -hmm. I thought that Higgins would play. I thought that um, I thought there was a shot that Greedy Williams would play, and I thought that Morgan Burnett would play. I didn't realize that he was at that point with an injury that uh, he was going to be a scratch too. And then, of course, 
you know, Denzel Ward went down also. So to have to put that thing together, uh, and, and, you know, here's a guy like Boris that was an Oakland Raider on Friday afternoon, and he was cut by the Raiders, and then he's starting for the Browns on Sunday against the Rams. That's pretty amazing. And I give Steve Wilkes and his staff, um, you know, a tip of the hat because I think that they came up with a way to play which was different probably than if Ward and Greedy Williams and Morgan Burnett and Demarius Randall had been back in that secondary. I mean, they played off a lot. They played softer, as they say, than they would have if they had had their regular personnel in there. And they kind of kept things in front of them. But then they made some plays out of it. And again, um, though, you know, the Rams ended up with two receivers that went over 100 yards in the game. Still, it was uh, considering the state of affairs in the Browns' defense, I thought they did an amazing job. I would have thought the Browns would have scored offensively more than 20 points in the game, especially if you tell me that the defense came up with three turnovers. There was a big swing in the game, and that was when the Browns took the lead after the touchdown pass by Mayfield. Carey came up with the interception, and the Browns had a first and 10 right out at midfield at the 49-yard line probably on the Cleveland side, yes. and they didn't do anything with that turnover. Yep. And then the Rams got the bye. And then there was a 21-yard punt by you know Gillen, who uh, they went after the punt, and he just kind of shanked one. And the Rams got out of a hole and actually ended up with pretty good field position out over their own 30-yard line after that shank punt. And then they went down and scored and ended up you know taking the lead for good. Yeah, I, I agree. That was, a, that was a big turning point. And, you know, Jimmy, the, the, the thing, though, to kind of wrap things up, you know, there, you and I have talked about this so many times. I mean, the Browns are are in a position where they, you know, they need to win their games at home and they need to win games in their division. Well, they're zero two now at home. They get their first division game coming up with the Ravens on on Sunday, and of course, it's getting any easier. Three of the next four are on the road here. So, uh, welcome to the to, welcome to the NFL, and this is going to be a tough stretch here for the Browns coming up. That's why the Tennessee opener was so important to win. Because when you did play the schedule game, when it came out, you would think, okay, they win the opening game at home, and then they'll beat the Jets. And little did we know at that time that they'd play the Jets without Sam Darnold and Mosley and all the people that they ended up losing going into that game and during the game. So, you know, I, I really felt they had a great shot and needed to come back 2-0 and to play the Rams, which we knew would be a very difficult game no matter what the situation was as far as injuries and where the Browns were or how they were playing. And that I think, you know, if this thing goes sideways, and it's tipping a little bit that way right now, and as you said, the schedule's very daunting now over the next month. The fact of the matter is I think you go back to that opening game so many times, and you and I talk about it a great deal. When you go 0-1, you know, it just really feels like 0-3 very, very quickly. This isn't 0-3, it's 1-2. But it becomes really, really hard, especially when you start dealing with having to put Band-Aids over your depth chart because of injuries. And when you're just having a major malfunction with your offense, uh, you have to do things on the fly, and it becomes hard to do. So when you're at your optimum health, which they were at the beginning of the year, you know, you just can't blow a game like they did in that opening game of the season. It's really haunting them right now. Yeah, I mean, they all count. They all count. I mean, it, it's easy sometimes to blow it off in December, but they all count, and uh, they, they, they needed to win that game. We talked about it all off season. Jimmy, I appreciate your time this morning. We'll look forward to catching you a little later on uh, today on uh, 3 News. All right, thanks a lot, Dino. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Jim Donovan, the voice of the Cleveland Browns, joining us. And, of course, our three new sports anchor here on uh, After Further Review. I'm Dave Tinatale as we jump right in with Jimmy. We'll get to some of your, uh, your uh, thoughts here on Facebook Live and also on Twitter. I put a poll out on Twitter uh, at Dino Cleveland and also uh, retweeted at WKYC. Uh, this morning's After Further Review poll question, what is the biggest problem with the Browns offense? I gave you four choices. You only get four. There could be more. But A, the offensive line. B, the play calling. C, Baker Mayfield is pressing. Jimmy talked a little bit about that. Or D, not getting the football to Odell Beckham, which I heard, you know, driving in here today and listening to some of the talk shows, and I heard some people talking about that last night. But you got, you know, you, you went out and you invested all this currency into going to get Beckham, and you gave up a first round pick, and, you know, you got to give him the ball. Didn't throw to him at all in that. Uh, First and goal, four, second and goal, third and goal, fourth and goal situation. Got to get the ball to OBJ. So far, 58% of you are talking about the play calling. 
26% say the offensive line, 12% say just Baker's pressing, and 4% are saying the Browns' biggest issue offensively is they're not getting the ball to Beckham. So uh, keep your votes coming, and, and we'll get to more of them on Twitter. Uh, a couple of people are, are messaging me. We'll get Matt Florjancic up here in a couple of minutes. Um, Robert saying here on Facebook Live, yeah, that fourth and nine draw play was a disaster, but if it worked, everyone would be talking about what a genius call it was. Yeah, it's the Sam Ritigliano thing, Robert, unfortunately, if some butts were candy and nuts. Uh, I, I, saw some, I saw some analytic last night, and, and maybe you've seen it too, that, you know, since we, we've started tracking plays, you know, nobody's ever run a draw on fourth and nine. I, I don't know if that's exactly true. I just, I, I, don't th I just don't think in that situation that's the right call. You know, maybe on third down if you want to do that, that's fine. But fourth down, not as much. It's just... It, all of a sudden, you're sitting there going against that defensive line, against Aaron Donald and, and the rest of that defense. I mean, Jimmy, you know, busted out all their names, all their superstars. Yeah, don't think that's that's how you want to end a drive. You know, I like getting the ball to Nick Chubb, but I like getting him in situations where he can win. Uh, Dave is upset, and I get I get it, Dave. All hype on paper. It's going to be a long season. The play calls, the stupid penalties, I don't even see 8-8. Eight eight. Oh, well, maybe next year. Well, okay. <laughs> I, I'm not going to – I get I, I get the frustration. I'm not writing things off. We've only, we're three games into this. We've got a long way to go. But I understand. I mean, the play calls are a problem. The offense, the, the – just, as Jimmy said, just the, the getting everybody aligned, getting the right 11 personnel in there and doing it so you're able to call the play when there's not like 0.5 seconds on the play clock, which I feel like it's like every time the Browns are calling plays, it's like they're sitting there going, man, they better hurry. They're going to get a delay a game call. And I, I, I just feel like this. So, yeah, I understand, though, the, 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 the frustration. I, I get it. I really do. It, it, it's, you know, this was, this was not supposed to be how – this season was going to go, we all thought, uh, see, Ryan says uh, it's E on my thing, all the above. Well, unfortunately, or I, I, yes, I, I get it. I get it. Um, the offense was supposed to be the strength of this football team because you went out and you got Beckham. You hired Freddie Kitchens, the offensive coordinator, to be your head coach. You have Landry. You have Chubb. You have Njoku, although you don't have him, of course, right now because he's hurt. You had Higgins and Callaway. Well, you didn't have either of those guys either. And keep that in mind. That's, you know, Jimmy had even said a minute ago he thought Higgins was going to play last night. You know, I mean, I saw Ben Axelrod. Uh, you know, we kind of had a almost like a little red carpet of players walking in and coming on to play. And Higgins was one of them. And, I mean, the way you looked, you, you thought Higgins was going to play. And, you know, Mayfield doesn't have, didn't have Njoku, didn't have Callaway, didn't have Higgins. That's another reason why I think he's struggling a little bit. Guys that he's comfortable with, he doesn't have right now. But it's a lot deeper than that. As we bring in WKYC, uh, news, 3 news sports reporter.com. That's not our, our WKYC.com, but that's our That was a long intro. Now. It is. <laughs> Matt Florjancic, good to have you, my man. Good to be here. Wish we were talking about a win. Uh, you and me both. I think it was the result we expected. I don't think it was the way we expected it, and that ultimately is why Cleveland Browns fans, especially you know people that came a long way to watch this game and to be a part of the first Sunday night football game that the Browns were involved in in 11 years is because it was so close and they had their chance. Yes. And they missed the boat. Yeah, it'd been one thing if, if they would have lost, let's say, 42 to 28 or something like that. I don't think you know the, if the offense had scored 28 points. I don't think we're we're having this type of discussion. It'd be like, okay, well, you know, it's because you're missing all those defenders, and okay, the offense played better. But the offense is still it's 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 a, it's like a sick offense right now. I ask everybody on Twitter, and I'll ask you, the biggest problem you see with the Browns' offense, four options. Offensive line, play calling, a quarterback that's pressing right now, or not getting the football to Beckham? I don't think the last one's the problem because I think in certain times they force the ball yes. to Odell and Jarvis, and they don't take advantage of who else is on the field. Uh, so I'm going to eliminate that one. Uh, Baker is pressing a little bit. I don't think it's the biggest concern to me. 
uh, as we talk about in, in baseball, a leaky bullpen is a scary thing. Yes. So is a leaky offensive yes. line in football. Uh, but that still does not add up to the concern I have about the play calling. Is the moment too big for Freddie? Is the spotlight too big for a guy who was an offensive coordinator for eight games last year? Right. Did we all put too much faith in those eight games uh, to believe that he was the guy that could get it done? Not saying that he can't get it done or he won't get it done because there's a lot of season left to play, but in the big spots so far in their two losses, his play calling has been suspect at best. And it, it, it's, you know, again, the, it's the fourth and nine. It's, you know, running a draw on fourth and nine. It's, it's not, it's having all your timeouts. And I actually was, was a little bit critical on Twitter as the Browns were driving down the field, they didn't they didn't use a timeout, but they they ended up having you know first and goal at the four with all their timeouts and an opportunity to tie the game, or if they elected to go for two, then maybe win it. Then, and I'm just like, wait a minute, they're not giving the ball to Chubb. He's not he's not in the backfield, as Jimmy pointed out. It's like in some of those situations, he was five wide and it was an empty backfield. Yeah, I don't. I mean, if Nick Chubb is a, is a good pass catcher. He he had a lot of knocks on his hands when he came into the NFL. A lot of yeah, people I, said I he couldn't he, catch. I think he's done a pretty good job. He's in that. a much better pass catcher than people give him credit for. However, uh, I, his best work is going to come out of the backfield. Yeah, and he proved it. Like he, I've compared him to Novocaine in the fact that it takes a while. But it does work. Yes. You know, I'm it does, stealing it does, a, ki it does I'm, kick in. I'm stealing a line from Remember the Titans and Denzel Washington. Just give it time, it'll That's work. Right. Uh, he's a guy that gets a lot of two, three, four yard carries, and then bam, yep. he'll, he'll spring a 15, 18 yard. And I applauded Freddie for sticking with it, even though that he, there were a lot of, there were some two, three yard carries. He stayed with Chubb even into the fourth quarter, which I thought was good. And then it's like they forgot about him yeah, down at the goal line. I, they took him out of the goal line situation in game one. They completely forget about running him in the goal line situation in week three. I don't know what he did to get into the doghouse yeah, <laughs> when it right. comes to those goal line situations. But you would think a bruising back that can take contact and keep moving the ball up the field is the kind of guy you want in a goal line right. situation. I, I just that that usage of the running back or lack thereof kind of baffles me. Here, and, and somebody brought this up. Yeah, you know, a lot of people brought this up last night and this morning about the play calling and does Freddie need to delegate? And this is why I bring this up. You know, you, you have a scenario during the fourth quarter where and and you know the guys on the TV broadcast, Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth, were were talking about it when. I think it was Ratley that got put, you know, or, or, or Ricky Seals Jones. I think that had gotten pushed out of bounds on a on a pattern that was in his direction, and the, the Browns had been guilty of an elite. I think it was like two men in motion penalty. But if they had challenged, if Freddie had challenged, there could have been a pass interference penalty. It would have offset and would have been second and nine instead of third and nine before the fourth and before the dreaded fourth and nine. Just those types of little scenarios. And little things that go into game management that sometimes when you're also thinking about calling the plays, okay, what play am I going to call here for third down? What play am I going to call for fourth down? I guess that's where I'm going with that. I just wonder if, if he needs a little help. I, I think he does. Uh, and I, you, you brought in these assistant coaches, these veteran assistant coaches to be your coordinator. Steve Wilkes on defense, Mike Prefer on special teams, Todd Munkin on uh, offense, you let Prefer do his thing, mm -hmm. you let Wilkes do his thing, mm -hmm. but oh, because you're an offensive coach, you want to have your hand in that pot. Trust the guy you brought right. in, let Monken do his job. A coordinator is not there just to run practices and meetings. He's there to call plays. Mm. And you have to figure out if you're not working, and I know that Play calling is part of the reason why you got the job. But if you're not working in an area that is successful, you need to find a way to make it successful. And maybe taking that off of Freddie's plate will be a way for him to be a game manager yeah. and let Todd Monken be the play caller. Because it's just, it, it's, 
it's not going to get any easier. You're going to have, I mean, you've got the Ravens coming up, the 49ers, Seahawks, Patriots, on and on. Um, you're going to have tight games. I mean, I, I, I think we feel like, especially. You hope the, you do. You hope you're going to have tight ball games. I mean, you know, the Browns defense is playing, you know, played well, certainly against the Rams. If the offense could put some points on the board, you're going to have tight games. You're going to need to figure out how to win in the fourth quarter. You need somebody, you need a head coach who can be a game manager. Yeah, you need a guy who's not going to, I don't want to say mess up, but just make uncommon calls in that situation that don't work. Like, it's good to think outside the box if it works and you look like a genius. But if it doesn't, you, you look like you don't know what you're doing. And last night was an example of, you know, a fourth and nine draw. Like ESPN put out a stat about that. Since 2007, they've been tracking plays. Never. There's never been a never There's been a draw. There's never been a successful draw from fourth and nine or more. Uh, you know, and I'm getting a lot of these types of, po of of messages. I mean, fans are fans are upset. Some of them are saying take it easy, but like John David said this about bringing John another year, same old team, another wait till next year scenario, overhyped and overrated. I, I understand where fans are coming from because you know you expect that with all the talent that's been assembled, and just going by the, the level of talent, th that they would have figured it out by now. You had, the, you had training camp, you had the preseason, but the problem, of course, was the preseason. A lot of these guys didn't play in the Nobody preseason. Nobody played. The, the, the starting offense didn't really play much in the preseason. This is essentially the preseason exactly. for the Browns now. Exactly. And, and, it, feels and, like, and, and it really, feels like it. And really a lot of teams across the league, if you're into fantasy football, you know that the first three weeks have been maddening for owners because uh, we, we're not sure still yet on the, the delegation of workloads at the running right. back spots or who's going to get the most touches at wide receiver. Who, If there is a third tight end that could actually score points in this league <laughs> on a consistent basis. You know, those uh, we're seeing it league-wide. Yeah. Nobody takes the preseason seriously anymore, and you're starting to see it leak into regular season games and t terrible performances by offenses and defenses. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's – it's not just the Browns, but in this case, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, the fans have a right, I think, to sit there and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, why, you know, you, you brought in all this offense, you know, but we didn't, you didn't play Landry, you didn't play Beckham at all in the preseason, you hardly played Chubb, you hardly played Mayfield, and... I think Chubb actually got, uh, outside of the wide receivers, he got the least amount of work in yeah, the preseason. Yeah. Which, I mean, I understood there was an imperative, especially later, to get Kareem Hunt some work. I think that that, that was appropriate. But, you know, it, it just it, it all goes with this offense that looks like it's out of sync and not ready. Yeah, quite frankly, you're right. They don't look ready. They don't look game ready. And that's a, a real shame because they did invest an awful lot in it, and there are talented players on the offense. They can score the ball. They just look completely out of sync. I mean, Baker's going to the sideline, and he's looking around like, what is going on? There might be a little bit more colorful language used than that. Yes. But uh, you know, if your quarterback is starting to show those signs, the rest of the team's going to feed off of it, and you got yourself a big problem. If he could do it all over again, do you think John Dorsey would not trade Kevin Zeitler for Olivier Vernon? No, I think he would still make the trade because he wanted to give another bookend defensive lineman to For Miles Garrett. Garrett. Uh, and he felt that they had the horses in the barn to replace Zeitler, which we all know proved that they didn't, yeah. and Austin Corbett, and they had to go out and make a couple trades, and now one of those guards ended up playing tackle for Chris Hubbard, who left the stadium in a walking boot last night, mm. and uh, it didn't look real confident that he was going to be back on the field anytime soon. So... Uh, I feel like if you're in a boot, that usually is like that. That's two to four. That's the that's, that's at, at least, least two, two to four, four weeks, weeks. Unless you know? you're JC Treader and yes. you have like the most incredible pain tolerance in the world. Um, yeah, I, I don't see Hubbard coming back the next couple of weeks. So you're going to have to lean on Justin McRae now, and your depth at offensive line is stretched about as thin as it can go. Wyatt Teller and Austin Corbett were active yesterday uh, for the first time this season. Yeah. And that's a guy you invested the number one pick in the second round just a couple years ago in. Yeah. And a guy that you traded two picks to the Buffalo Bills for. 
and they're barely seeing the field. Right. So that that's a problem. They I would have thought I would have thought Teller would have would, would play. Have I thought he was going to be in the starting lineup. I, did, I, I, now, I thought he was going to be. Yeah, I thought they would have him ready for opening day. Yeah. When they made the <coughs> excuse me when they made the deal, I thought they were going to have him ready for the Titans game, and it's like, wait a minute, why did why did you invest this capital in a yeah. guy that you, apparently you know you don't think is better right now than the guy that's out there in Cush? You don't trade two picks for an offensive lineman if he's going to be inactive. Right. You, you just don't do it. In my opinion, you know, I've never been in those boardrooms or picked up those phone calls from other GMs and tried to strike a deal, but it just seems like that that deal was meant to get a starter and it's not been the case. But I still think John Dorsey takes that risk and sends Zeitler away to New York. I don't think he regrets that. I think he might regret forgetting about the tackle spot in yeah. the NFL draft. Yeah. I think we all kind of shook our heads when you know, he spent the first five picks on – actually, the first five rounds were basically all defense, a kicker, and then he got an offensive lineman late. Right. Uh, and that tackle was a small school guy who transitions to guard or right. uh, interior offensive line work. So – it didn't really make a whole lot of sense when they just kind of forgot about the left tackle spot. Mm -hmm. And the trade market's kind of thin at left tackle because, you know, they're important pieces of yeah. offenses here. Um, did, was surprised they didn't get in on the Laramie Tunsil deal. Um, unfortunately, he ended up going to Houston. Yeah. Uh, Washington seems content to let Trent w Williams sit out and try to work out that situation. If they weren't, I'd be on the horn with them real I quick. I would too, yeah. And I'd be saying, uh, name your price and we'll right. figure out a deal. Because, I mean, that's the thing. You're, you've got to figure out how to, to address this, and, and there's not an answer. There are not many, not many teams. You know, get, getting an offensive tackle is like trying to get a starting pitcher. I mean, teams generally aren't willing to part with, with, with somebody who, who can be a bookend tackle. A foundation piece on their offensive yeah. line. Yeah. yeah, it's the most important position in football outside of quarterback, and it's the one that the Browns didn't have to worry about for all those more years. than a decade yeah. with Joe Thomas. Uh, very much like the kicker spot with Phil Dawson. You knew it was in capable hands. Uh, and kicking an offensive line, a little bit of a question mark. Seibert has done well over the first three weeks. Sands the uh, extra point miss against Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, looking at that offensive line, deeply concerned about those guys up front. They're all wor I know they're all working hard, but it just it seems like there's too many holes in the boat to try to plug yeah. with one guy. Two last things for you before I let you go here and before we wrap this up the show here. Um, Baker mentioned this in his interview with Mike Tirico last night, and I think Bob Wiley had talked about this uh, when he kind of gave an interview about – you know, Freddie and, and Greg Williams and, not, and Williams not getting the job. Did we maybe underestimate the importance that Ken Zampezi had on Baker, his preparation in the offense last year as kind of the, the lieutenant to Freddie as quarterback's coach during that, that great offensive run? Yeah, I think we did. Uh, I think we gave all the credit to Freddie and didn't realize that it was – more of a committee that got Baker ready for those games. Uh, they brought in a couple other guys to, to help out, uh, a former NFL quarterback in Ryan Lindley. Now, he was at the running back spot last yeah. year, but I'm sure he was still in those meetings uh, with Baker trying to say, hey, you know, look for this, look for that. Um, yeah, I think we did underestimate the importance of it being a full team effort to get that quarterback, mm -hmm. that rookie quarterback, ready to play on Sundays. And the other thing, this is this might be you said a stretch earlier, but I was thinking about this because we we had some news about the Cavaliers this morning, and they've got a new radio play-by-play -play announcer, and he's a guy you and I both know well, Tim Alcorn. Um, somebody said, you know, the, the first year LeBron came back to the Cavaliers in 2014, you know, they got blown. I remember they the the Knicks ended up beating them on opening night, and they they yeah. it took them a little time to gel. And I'm not saying the Browns are going to go and go to the Super Bowl or anything in their first year, but do we maybe need to all exercise a little bit of patience as they they try to figure out Beckham and and all this 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 puzzle that they're trying to put together in the offensive side? A little patience might not be a bad thing. Uh, stepping back from the expectations is probably even more important. Look, this team 
you know, is very talented. Mm-hmm. We all know that on paper they are talented, but as Freddie said, whoop the hell. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter. You yeah, know, he, he did say that. It does not matter. You have to show up on game day. And I think they would be much better served if they use the run to set up the pass yeah. rather than trying to force it into tight windows. That's partially why Baker's pressing and why his completion percentage is down. He's throwing in the tight windows that he really shouldn't be throwing yes. into. And if you do that, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to commit turnovers. Yeah, and you, you got to put him in a situation to win. I mean, Collinsworth was talking all what, last night about, you know, he, he, when, when, when he has the ball in his hand for two or three seconds and throws it, well, you know, he looks good and, and the offense is, is sharper. But, like, on a third and ten, you can't have three of your four receivers in a pattern going down the field 30 yards – with this offensive line. I mean, that you're, you're not giving Mayfield a chance because you're not giving the receivers an opportunity to get open before Mayfield is flushed and it ends up being, you know, a situation where you just got to eat it or throw it away. You take the short stuff that's there, the crossing routes, the slants, the outs. You take that intermediate passing game when it's there and you use that along with the running game to set up those 30-yard fly routes. Right. You know, you can't do that all the time right out the gate. First of all, you become extremely predictable, and that's easy for defensive coordinators to scheme up. And secondly, it, when your offensive line is a problem, you can't ask is. them to block for five yeah. seconds before Baker can even get to his drop and throw the ball down the field. It's not going to work. It's a formula that can't work unless they tweak it. Yeah, exactly. Matt, we appreciate it. I know uh, you'll be uh, monitoring uh, Freddie a little later on today and uh, plenty of uh, content at WKYC.com in the aftermath of this one. Oh, no question about it. Uh, It's going to be an interesting press conference day. Oh, yeah. Look forward to that. (laughs) Always is. Always is. these games. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Dino. All right. Matt Florjancic, again, read him up at WKYC.com. A lot of reaction from last night's game, and we'll certainly have more when Freddie Kitchens talks to the media today. Jared says... Uh, Trent Williams, yeah, may as well. We are probably drafting a lineman in the first round anyways. Move Robinson to right tackle, all of a sudden the guards don't look so bad. Well, yeah, I, I don't know how much Trent Williams will, would, would cost from the Redskins, but, yeah, would I be making a, a, a call today to uh, Redskins Park? Yeah, I, I would, Jared. I, I agree with you. Uh, just two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, Matt says, say yeah, I would have done it two weeks ago. Uh, and then just wrapping up our Twitter poll, more than 350 of you have voted already. Great stuff. Um, the biggest problem with the Browns offense, 57% say the play calling, 29% say the offensive line, 11% say Baker Mayfield is pressing. And uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, let's see, somebody says, uh, BJ says, scheme and system. Okay, you know, that I could have put that in there too, but uh, – that's, that's all part of it. I mean, this is an offense that's got problems, and they need to figure it out because it doesn't get any easier. Ravens' defense is awaiting them this Sunday, and then after that, San Francisco, Seattle, on and on and on. All right, great stuff from everybody today. Thank you so much for your tweets and your Facebook posts, and we'll certainly have more coverage today in the aftermath of the Browns' loss 20-13 to to the Los Angeles Rams on Sunday Night Football. This has been After Further Review for Brian Crane and Jim Donovan and also Matt Florjancic. I'm Dave DiNatale. Thanks for watching, and have a great day, everyone.